Good morning, everyone. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much for coming to the Air Distinguished Speaker this morning. My name is Catherine. I work at the Hariri Institute, and I have the pleasure of introducing Holly on behalf of the Air Corps faculty this morning. So a round of applause for Holly. We'll start off with that. Thank you so much for making the journey to BU for us today. Holly Rushmere is the John C. Millen Professor of Computer Science at Yale University, where she has taught since 2004. She received the PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell University in 1988. Holly worked at Georgia Tech and IBM Research before joining Yale. Their research interests include shape and appearance capture, applications of perception in computer graphics, modeling material appearance, and developing computational tools for cultural heritage. Holly is a fellow of the ACM and a recipient of the 2013 ACM Computer Graphics Achievement Award. This talk will be recorded and put on the Hariri Institute YouTube channel. Uh, it will probably be posted by Friday next week, so please feel free to watch again. Uh, Holly will present, and then we'll open it up for about 15 minutes of questions. And I just ask you to raise your hand. I'll come around with a microphone. All right, Holly, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm going to be talking about applications of artificial intelligence <coughs> and machine learning in the areas where I do research, well, a couple of the areas. And uh, particularly, um, I, I wanted to contrast. Um, on one hand, I do basic computer graphics research. Basically, uh, how can we make pictures better, cheaper, faster? And the big problem in, in generating new pictures for you know, realistic games and movies is creating the digital content that is then used to render out uh, the, uh, the, uh, the film or the game. And initially, about you know, 10, 15 years ago, when, when the whole deep learning uh, revolution came, people were very skeptical, like, oh, neural nets, you can put anything in and out, and you have a black box, and you can't trust it. But we've overcome that, and machine learning, deep learning, uh, various other uh, 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 methods have become uh, very standard as a component. We've learned like where ML fits in uh, to an overall solution in graphics. And I'll give you an example of, of that. The other area I work in is, is cultural heritage preservation, which uh, is, is, is a bit different. People are more hesitant because it's, it's a sensitive area, so people are hesitant about using uh, black boxes and so forth. So I'll give you some examples of, of what we're doing there and not so much big successes of, of using uh, machine learning and cultural heritage, but some opportunities and, and promise for the future. So let me start out with uh, computer graphics uh, content creation and uh, an area I focus, which is material modeling and basically material appearance modeling. So let me, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, in graphics, uh, explain why that's important. Uh, so su suppose we're going to make uh, an image that's part of a movie or in a, in, a, in, in a VR scene and so forth. What do, how do we start with a bunch of numbers and make a picture? Um, we have, a, we've uh, defined shape or geometry and we've attached some material model to that geometry. And that model is going to, uh, to uh, describe when light hits a point, how does it scatter? Does it all go in one direction like a mirror? Does it go in all directions like a matte surface? Mathematically, what happens when, when light hits a, p a point on the surface? And then we're going to have a, a, a numerical definition of the light sources in the scene. And then we're going to uh, visualize uh, the turn set. So far, we've just talked about the scene in general. Then for a particular image, we need a viewpoint and a view frustum, like what's going to be in the scene. A great definition that I heard recently uh, of what a view frustum is, it's that region of space that you have to clean up before a Zoom call. Basically, everything in that uh, frustum is going to be seen by the camera. So that's that's what that is. So then we'll have a, 
an image in, on the image plane. And to make a picture, we need to determine what color should be set for every pixel in that image. And we do that by tracing light from the light source, how it bounces around the room, how it scatters off the object, and then passes through the image plane and reaches the eye. And what reaches the eye through any given uh, pixel is going to be the result of you know, you know, you know, uncountable numbers of, of, of light paths. And determining which paths to follow and computing those is, is one area of graphics that sees a lot of research. But I'm interested in the how do we describe when the light hits the surface, how does it scatter? And that's the material appearance model. So another way of looking at, like, why is it important to model uh, materials accurately? Here we have three objects, and they're all the same boring white stuff. So uh, scattering has a spectral component. Here, all the wavelengths are scattered the same way. It has a directional component. It may be mirror-like or diffuse or something in between. And it also has a spatial variation. Very few things are absolutely the same, same scattering every point on the surface. When we add a material model to these objects and to the surrounding where they're setting in, suddenly they look like they're made of different stuff. You would have different expectations of you know, um, whether with, if you touch them, whether they'd feel warm or cold, whether they'd be heavy. You make a lot of judgments and different judgments for these different objects because they have uh, different material appearance models applied. And that's you know, a subtle reason why getting materials right is important. We make a lot of judgments based on these material appearance. For example, we judge is this wet or dry, or where is it wet, where is it dry? We look at, we, we get a sense of time, like how long ago was this wet, how long has it been drying? Uh, this is a, an example of a, a longer uh, time frame, the, the idea of as things get older, they weather, and different processes go on, like this patination of copper. Um, value is, is judged by appearance, these are, you know, pearls of different uh, value that, that are judged by people who professionally look at their appearance. We judge scale by appearance. Um, even if you didn't see uh, the, the edges of these, of these uh, blocks, you would, you would uh, assume that the, uh, the block on the left is thinner because more light scatters through it. That's because of the material model. It's very important to get the material model right to say, tell a story. Here we have the old car and the new car, so different materials are applied that help convey that idea. And of course, um, in, in games uh, for, uh, for rendering characters and where they are, it's important. A lot of money goes into designing the materials that will be applied physically, but we want to simulate them accurately in, in the computer for things like uh, cars. A huge amount of effort goes into uh, formulating new, interesting-looking coatings for cars or things like a uh, home decor. And then a, a, a lot of uh, applications of graphics uh, increasingly is for training, for accelerating training by doing training in virtual environments before setting people out into physical environments that might be dangerous or expensive or to create events that are rare in, in, in reality, but you want to train people to deal with them. But, and often in these, in these uh, kind of tasks, it's important what are you going to see in order to perform your task correctly. So things uh, like this uh, one instance of uh, the rendering the materials for uh, doing brain surgery is, is one, uh, one uh, training task. Another one where you can't do a lot of on the spot training is repairs in space. You're going to do those kinds of repairs virtually first. And then going from, uh, from that to uh, touching a bit on the heritage that I'll talk about later, in recreating the past, a lot of times people you know, recreate um, the, the cities, the buildings, and so forth. But it looks like a cartoon, and you start getting this impression like the past was like this big cartoon, but actually it was just as 
it had the same stones and, and dirt and sky as we have now. So giving a proper interpretation of the past depends on getting the materials right. And, you know, and the other uh, example showing that often when artworks were created, the materials looked different, but then as a, as a, as a result of aging, they change in appearance. And by identifying the materials, we can de-age them and get a better sense of what the artist was looking at. So that's why material uh, simulation is important. And there are, when you start uh, looking at this research area, there are lots of topics. There's things like wavelength effects and diffraction, and you have uh, volumes and how do you model how the how stuff varies, uh, you know, like if you crack open a rock, how does it look inside? Uh, so, and, and weathering and aging effects. So I'm gonna just talk about one of a lot of different research topics in material appearance. And this one is about how do I, you know, I'm, I'm going to design something like, well, this room's not a great, I think, because they used a lot of white here, but, you know, considering the floor and what these ceilings are going to look like. I have different materials in mind that I want to use, and all I have is a little picture of them. So that's what these are. These are little pictures. This is a little picture of some shingles, some bricks, and some grass. So you can take your camera and look straight at, like, a brick building and take a little picture of the bricks and say, this is, you know, I'm going to make this building. I want it covered in this kind of bricks. And these samples maybe are just 256, 256, 512 by 512 sets, uh, pixels of, of these example materials. And what we want to do is take those examples and put them all over a model. So I have some shingles, but I want to put them all over the roof on a large expanse. I want to put the bricks all over the face of the house. And then, after I've extended the, the materials and done that, well, that's not quite what I wanted. I want to tweak the colors, the sizes, and come up with a different design. So basically, to do this, I want to take these original little pixel uh, samples and turn them into mathematical functions, into procedures. Then with a procedure, I can make vast expanses of the material and with the parameters of those procedures, I can edit them and adjust the appearance. So the way that we do that is, that's where we come to machine learning. So can we do this? Well, of course we can, or I wouldn't have brought it up. So how do we, uh, procedural modeling is very common uh, these days. I don't know if those of you who use Bl uh, Blender, Maya, but the way you make a, a procedural material in graphic systems today is with visual programming and these so-called node graphs. Each box is some, uh, some atomic function, some very basic function, like applying a noise function, creating a noise function, creating a simple structure, doing a blur filter. And basically, by visual programming and connecting all these blocks together, you can get very complex material effects. And this is what artists you know, in, in film industry and games use to design uh, detailed materials. Looking at this a bit more abstractly, these node graphs contain uh, generator functions that generate basic pa patterns or basic uh, noise functions. And then the filters like blurring and, and com combinations to put together so that in the end you have uh, in this case, a material that's um, modeled by the albedo, which is the, the, the color that's reflected, and then uh, the normals, which is the uh, small-scale surface orientation of the surface. So what we want to do is start with this little pixel sample and create a node graph that will produce a material that looks like that little sample that we can generate arbitrary amounts of, and then we can change by changing the parameters in the node graph. And as a general problem, it's, you know, basically this is a program generation. It's like, here's the output I would like from my computer program, write me all the code. <laughs> That's the problem we're looking at. So to break it down to something simpler, we start out with, well, basically I'm gonna assume I have a lot of programs, a huge number of programs, my problem is going to be to choose the right one 
and then figure out the parameter settings for that one. So I'm going to reduce this problem to selection and then parameter estimation. So what we do is, um, first of all, you know, we're all used to uh, Dolly now, right? And you say, like, show me a picture of brick, and it will show you a picture of brick, and you think, wow, there, there it is. It, it did that all by itself. But, but really, there's a huge space of things that we call brick. And so we collected, uh, so for various classes like brick and stucco and grass, we collected huge numbers of images and then did, uh, for each of those classes, unsupervised learning to find clusters of them, to find various types of brick, to find various types of grass. And then we also went to the existing uh, node graph that you can get at a place like uh, Substance Designer uh, th with the, the share sites from art artists. And for loads of graphs, cre uh, generated loads of samples and found where the samples from each graph landed in these uh, categories that we found when we did unsupervised learning on natural images. And basically, we use that mapping to, when we have a new image, to go in and see which cluster did I fall in and which procedural model does the best job for that particular cluster. That helps us do the selection, and then we need to, uh, to uh, find the parameters. So basically summarizing, we, we, we collected a lot of images. We did unsupervised learning to find clusters of types of materials. And then um, we, uh, we found which, which current existing node graphs map to those clusters. So this is just an example of uh, the, the number of clusters we found from things that were called brick, things called grass, stucco, shingle. And just to give you an example, there are a lot of different kinds of things that fall into the category brick. And so you can see the subtle ch differences between the various classes. And different node graphs will be good at generating different ones of these. Probably it's the same in Boston. When I'm in New Haven, I walk down the street, I see 50 different kinds of bricks. I mean, that's just the old New England kind of thing we live in, right? Uh, what's another interesting thing, in, in, in grass, we found uh, from the natural images all these clusters of grass. When we looked at node graphs that produce grass, none of them covered some of the classes. So an un unforeseen uh, byproduct was, where are some areas we ought to design node graphs to be able to cover this whole class? Anyway, that's about selection. Then how do we estimate the parameters? It's these very complicated functions with lots of parameters. Rather than try to, uh, to come up with some uh, analytical approach for this, basically we trained uh, uh, CNNs for, for each uh, uh, node graph to, for given uh, an image, find the best parameters on that node graph for, uh, to produce this image and basically used uh, this architecture for that training. So we did all that, and these are the kinds of results we got. So on the left, you have uh, the input image, and then we have in the next column our estimated albedo image, the color of reflected light, then the estimated surface normal, and then those rendered together uh, for, uh, for what the, the material will look like uh, when rendered on an object. And then you know, we got similar kinds of quality results for uh, grass, not perfect, but similar to the examples we're given. And for shingles, the different kinds of, of shingles produced. Another kind of material that you probably see a lot around Boston like we do in uh, New Haven. And for some stucco. So this is why model selection matters. These, uh, the selected model, unselected are both node graphs that say brick, we produce brick. For this, uh, for this uh, brick sample, if we choose the right one, we get a great result. If we make a bad choice, it, it looks really not much like the original one. And similar for the stucco example. So given the, um, uh, the, the procedural uh, uh, graph then, 
we can t start with our small sample and produce a large expanse of, of the material. Now we can take that small sample and make a whole street of these things, right? So the first improvement is, can we get rid of having to train every single node, a, a network for every single node graph to do parameter estimation? Well, and this is generally, the, you know, optimizing a chosen material graph. And the idea is that if, uh, so we have some, we have, we've selected the best node graph we can get, and we have some target appearance. We can take the output of our graph and render it, and then compare it to our target and compute some loss, and then use that to uh, update the parameters. And we can do that if this whole, uh, if this whole graph is differentiable. We can use differentiable rendering and, and, and update uh, the parameters to get closer. And this original idea was developed by a, a group from uh, MIT and Adobe. But the problem uh, with, with their approach was not all the nodes in these graphs are differentiable. Generally, the filters like blurring and so forth, those are, are differentiable and you can optimize those parameters. But the generators, uh, they, they generally have integer inputs, they have stochastic output. Some of them uh, are, are basically bl black boxes that people uh, pr provided. So there's generally for producing the generators and structures, they're not differentiable, so we can't get a good answer with this idea of differentiable rendering. So the idea, though, is let's replace those non-differentiable uh, generators with a proxy that is di dif differentiable. And basically, that we can do that by training a neural net to perform approximately the same function as that generator. It's not going to be perfect. It's not exactly the same. But as you can see here, with between the non-differentiable and differentiable, you can get fairly close. So then we can go through our optimization with the proxy, get pretty close to the right parameter, and then go back and put in uh, the real generators and finish optimizing our, our node graph. And this is just an example. Uh, we we uh, used an existing architecture for style-based generation replace the latent space, got rid of the noise input, and then we have a, a network for training our proxy. And these are the kinds of results compared to the previous work where th these are two, two sets of examples. Uh, the leftmost column are, are the first thing that our selected graph gives, and the, and the uh, rightmost is the target we're trying to achieve. And basically, you can see that ours with the differentiable proxies are able to uh, find the parameters to get both the structure of, 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 the, uh, of the material pattern as well as the fine scale reflectance properties. Another improvement is like, do we have to select graphs? That limits us to only the things, the classes of materials people have already built nodes for. Can we create a, a graph from scratch? So basically, do not rely on, 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 on a, an existing graph. Well, for some classes of materials, we were able to do that. Basically, by decomposing uh, um, materials into subcomponents and then uh, building this hierarchy of some subcomponents and then uh, modeling each of the, 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 the leaf components with noise functions. So basically, here's an I and to do this segmentation, we ask the user to make a small number of strokes on different uh, materials in, in, the, uh, in the sample. And so in this case, of the, these are some uh, rusty metal strips with thin spacers between them. So there's the thin spacers and then the rusty metal, and then the rusty metal is uh, divided into the unrusted and unrusted segments. And then given that uh, segmentation, we can model each component material with, uh, with a, a hierarchy of noise functions. And then we just have to somehow come up with a function for the masks that, that separate out one material from another. 
And fortunately, to do that, there was a recent paper on, on, on um, texture basis functions, basically six fundamental functions with parameters that you can uh, use to create a vast array of, of, of patterns. So using those functions, creating a big database of possibilities, taking our desired mask, searching in that database, finding the closest example, and then, uh, uh, and then um, optimizing the parameters to get very close to our desired mask. So that's how we come up with this pipeline. And then with the pipeline, we can build from scratch, basically starting with this template of combining uh, noises, but in, in this hierarchical fashion. So we're composing a new graph that hadn't existed before. And these are some example um, uh, results. So uh, in each case, the left side are a material that somebody captured by taking a lot of photographs and basically creating this uh, pixel map representation of the material. And then on the right is our procedure that uh, reproduces the material. You can see they're not pixel by pixel the same, but they're the same stuff. I mean, that's our goal is we want loads of the same stuff, not loads of the same exact pixel. And then, of course, the same story. We, you know, given a small sample, we can make large expanses of it. And here's just a couple more. And the point with the, the light spinning around is to emphasize this is a material. It's not just producing a static image, but it's producing a, a, a map of the functions for how light scatters from each point. And then this is showing how um, once we have our procedural, you know, th there's the original sample, we proceduralize it, and then we have uh, parameters we can tune and make changes in the geometric shapes and the scattering properties. And so we, the, the original is just close to what we want. It isn't the exact material we're going to use in our model, but we can adjust it to tune for our application. So that's a little example of, of, of how machine learning is used in, uh, a, as a component in solving a, a problem in computer graphics content creation. So let me turn now to my, my other area where uh, ML hasn't taken hold as, as much uh, for, for, for a, a lot of reasons, but this is uh, the area of cultural heritage preservation. And I will talk a little bit about studying individual cultural heritage objects and then studying sites. And first, this is my model. I've been working in this area for, for about 20, 25 years. Um, we have all these ways of imaging and get, gathering data about heritage artifacts, heritage sites. And we have all these applications. We, there's conservation we want to they preserve the paintings, the stones, and so forth. And then we have humanists who use you know, the, the, the artifacts, the books, and so forth that we can observe to draw conclusions about the past, about culture, about history. And then we have, <coughs> as, as in, from, from what they are able to learn and the basis of, of the, uh, the artifacts that they draw those conclusions from, we want to communicate to the public about our past, about our history. And the, the thing about cultural heritage is it's a really under-resourced area. I mean, there's just not enough money to pay for conserving things, right? It's because, I mean, we have a lot, you know, we have basic food, health, and stuff considerations. So this is always down the list in, in things to spend money on. So what we need to do is all the, the kinds of data and stuff that we, that we collect and the computational tools we build, we want to be able to reuse the data for all of these purposes. And basically, they work in, in a cycle, right? So that you know, we want to conserve things, preserve things, so that, that, that they can be studied, they can be analyzed, we can learn from them, and that learning can be disseminated to the public for for their good, and that's a reason for people to continue support the, the, the conservation. And just, you know, the physical monitoring, the, the historic reconstructions, and then the storytelling. 
Um, as I say, I've been doing this for a little, you know, well, more than 20 years. I got into it from the visual point of view of doing uh, scanning and building uh, uh, visuals, uh, um, visual tw uh, virtual twins of objects like Tutankhamun's throne uh, for the purpose of a communication like this uh, Eternal Egypt website. Some of the more recent things uh, I've worked on are uh, studying medieval manuscripts. Not, not, not from the point of view of reading them because, for example, this manuscript is from the Book of Hours, which is a standard prayer book. It's not, it's not a, a mystery what it says. It's a standard prayer book that you know, has the standard prayers in it. Things that are interesting are the visual layout because how the layout of various copies of these changed is part of the evolution of how people thought about books. So my colleague here from English, uh, Jessica Brantley, was interested in when you have lots and lots of manuscript pages, how uh, is the, layout, the visual layout changing? So we were using um, uh, machine learning methods to, to isolate the text and isolate the various images around that for that study. Also, the materiality, we, we did uh, multispectral scanning of these, of these pages for another scholar who was interested in how did the inks used change in appearance across pages in a book or between individual books? Anyhow, all, over the years I've been doing that, we've gotten loads of new, of new tools, things that, you know, we took a couple weeks in the museum, now you could go in with your phone and do it in half an hour, right? Um, and, and we have lots of new tools for presentation, all the, you know, the 3D printing, WebGL, all sorts of things. Lots of progress, but some of the, the big problems are still difficult to tackle, and that is making sense. You have lots of data, lots of different data types. It's distributed all over, um, and when we do come up with things for, for studying and understanding this, uh, basically, the humanist or the conservator needs you know, a, a, a technical computer science buddy to figure out how to run all this stuff. And basically, that's a really expensive enterprise, and we're in this under-resourced area. And not only that, we do all this technical stuff, but what's important is the human insights into these objects and what things mean. And we, we don't have good ways of keeping track of that. So let me give you a, a bit more information about what I mean by that. And let's first look at studying objects. And as I already said, we have all these new imaging methods. There's all sorts of new ways. If you have an object that's going to be conserved, ways of imaging it and finding out uh, its, its current uh, state of preservation. And each one of these devices comes out with new d types of data in different forms. And basically, the, the, the person who, uh, say, the conservator is studying an object has you know, data from lots of different uh, 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 devices. They produce different kinds of data. They have different kinds of software to look at that data. And this is all funneling down to one person who has to uh, get insight into the state of this object and what should be done to, uh, to preserve it. So this is real mishmash, and it's a lot of expensive stuff. It's a lot of switching between stuff. So it's, it, it's, it's wasting computational resources. Um, it's very confusing because the, the, the uh, controls on these different programs vary. And uh, a lot of times the, the, the software is made like, well, you have um, you know, CAT scan data, but all the software is tuned for you know, looking for things in people's heads as opposed to looking at the, you know, the, the structure of a wooden object. So one project we tackled first is, can we make an interface to integrate all the different kinds of data a conservator might want in an interface that's consistent and makes sense to them? In our first generation, we you know, maybe went a little overboard and called, board and called this hyper 3D software for looking at all these data types. Here's just a, a little uh, video of um, in, in, in action. So basically, you can look at data from different sources, but the interactions are consistent for when you're turning things, when you're changing uh, the light source. One thing is like 3D uh, CAT scan data. We've got a 
uh, 3D scan shape, and this is a, uh, a multispectral scan, so you can look at the spectrum from individual points. So that's great. It, 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 inter it integrates everything um, into one uh, framework. But then talking to conservators, they said, you know, th this is great, but it's not enough. It really doesn't help us do our job. And this is sort of a rough sketch that one of them made was, we've got all these different kinds of data sets, and they come into your program, and our next generation we called Cherub instead of Hyper 3D. And then what we're doing is generating a hypothesis in our mind. And so what we'd like to do is be able to, uh, to annotate and mark down what we're seeing in each of these things, and, and so we can synthesize all our observations to form our hypothesis and reach a conclusion. And we'd also like to be able to illustrate to others what we saw in all these things and how we drew this conclusion. So we had to go back and, and, and look at the interface, and instead of being preoccupied like with how do I change the light source direction, start thinking about how does the user enter information, not just view information. So entering things like, you know, allowing them to ent enter annotations, to bookmark views. Here's all the things I brought in and the views I was looking at of those objects. I want to bookmark that so I can go back to that point in time where I had this idea of what was going on. So we ended up, you know, adding bookmarks, annotations. And annotations became a, a, a challenge because you have lots of different types. You're going to annotate images, annotate 3D shapes, annotate volumes of stuff. It may be an annotation that applies to the whole object. It may be to one point. It may be to an area. It may be to a volume. So you have lots of different annotation types to, uh, to uh, add in the different uh, format input, the different selection mechanisms. And annotations aren't just text, but we also may want to annotate with another image. And then some way to sort out the, the types of annotations, in this case, color coding. So we, we experimented with pro providing all that, and then how, how does the, uh, the person using this for a study summarize their results? And initially, we just had a report generation that would show uh, the very, uh, a, a schematic of the various visual objects and, and the observations, which sort of did the job, but is incredibly boring. It's very, diff you know, it's, it's tedious to read. It's all there, but tedious. So we had the idea, what we really want is a video. Now, I mean, the, you, you could record yourself doing all this study, but that's, you know, that's hours and hours and tedious also. You could record it and then, like, do all sorts of editing in Premiere or whatever and condense it down. But we, there's no reason that somebody who's doing art conservation or studying an object should somehow learn to be some sort of video production expert. What we want to do is produce a video where they can stay focused on their task and stay focused on their, their observations and then by organizing those, automatically generate a video. So this, this in, in this new system, Cherub, so we want them to say, what are the objects you saw and what you wrote about them? Organize that, give us that organization, and we'll spit out a video. So this is what the generator uh, input looks like. You don't have to record yourself or you know, figure out how to make this thing spin to the right place and get it oriented. Just you know, give us the objects in order that you want to present and then the notes that you had on them that you want to present, give that to us and we'll make a video. And we make a video by basically attaching an animation scheme to each kind of annotation. So if there's a point in an image, basically the image comes up, the, uh, the, the, the highlighting of the point comes up, and then a subtitle. So the, 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 the schemes can be for like 2D images quite simple, but we have uh, these, you know, like the, the, the point appearing. Uh, we have uh, an area highlighted. Um, and then for the 3D objects, the user doesn't have to figure out what are the good views, how do I get to them. That animation scheme is generated automatically. So we have that for the different kinds of annotations. So uh, just to give you an idea of sort of what this looks like, 
This is a case study from Grove Street Cemetery, uh, the oldest privately owned cemetery in the US. Uh, so significant that way. Also very convenient, it's across the street from the CS building. So that's where our case study is. And this is an example in, in our system, being able to view the various kinds of data from, from the cemetery. And then uh, an, uh, a video of, of the results. And we'll just start, like this is beginning the entry uh, to the cemetery, um, highlighting uh, the, the inscription on it. And then in the sake of time, moving along to some of the other, this is highlighting one particular stone that measurements were made on and a particular point where something was observed, an observation about uh, the larger area on the stone. And then going into the 3D model that was obtained by photogrammetry and uh, isolating various features about the, the state of preservation of this stone. Going into like where uh, a comment was made at the top of the stone and then uh, all of this obviously choreographed automatically just to go to where the, uh, the comments were made so that the user doesn't have to uh, figure out any of this stuff. And then fi uh, the final thing is then to segue to the, uh, the other kind of imaging modality, which is reflectance transformation imaging, uh, which reveals the surface normals and then highlighting the, the inscription that becomes clearer in this mode. So it's, it's, you know, it's not like a riveting video, but it's easier than reading a report. And, uh, and for one professional to communicate to another, it's much more efficient. But this is where I see one of these things where it's a big opportunity. Everybody's talking about uh, the, the chat bots, right? And, and about, um, you know, everybody's probably told you in your homework you can't use them, right? That you're not supposed to generate an essay automatically. But basically in these, in these, in these, in these uh, automated systems, if you gave it basically the facts that you want to present in the logical order in your conclusion, having it generate nice text to express that, that's really useful, right? I mean, that saves a lot of time. Because um, then, you know, you're in control of the content and it's just making it smoother for somebody else to read and you can edit it afterwards. That kind of thing would be great to do with the video, right? Because you want the, uh, the person making the interpretations to be in control of all the content, which visuals, what are the interpretations. But then putting it all together into a nice visual display how can we learn to do that? I mean, it's, 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 uh, we've, we've broken down the project a bit with these animation schemes. It's not gonna be uh, you know, an easy, okay, we have a thousand examples of, here are some interesting facts and a beautiful video that expresses them. Let's throw them into a black box and learn how to do that. But I think we can learn how to uh, assist people so that they don't have to learn how to be a great animator or, or video producer to uh, effectively um, communicate their observations. The, the last thing I, I want to talk about is about studying sites in, 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 in cultural heritage preservation. And I'm mainly thinking of archaeological sites. And the site I've been focusing on for, for many years is Dura Europis. It's a site in what is now uh, Syria. Um, it was uh, actively occupied from 300 BC to 258 AD by many different cultures, the Hellenistic culture, Parthian, Roman. That makes it interesting because it was a sort of a, a, a cultural crossroads and many different religions coexisting. Uh, many of the, uh, you know, the, there's a Mithraeum and, you know, the various, um, various religions we don't hear about much anymore. There was also a spectacular synagogue and uh, uh, a, a, a very early uh, uh, Christian church built in, in a home. All of these existed in the same place and all of them also are of um, artistic interest. Um, it, the site was largely uh, forgotten or uh, you know, unattended for you know, uh, millennia, uh, just after World War I, though, uh, some uh, 
British soldiers uh, you know, were in the area. It was still uh, Syria was under the British mandate. And they ran across these gorgeous paintings digging up there uh, in the site. And that, that uh, inspired um, a whole new archaeological excavation of the site. The mandate passed to the French, so the excavations were a combination of uh, a, a group from Yale and a group from France for about a decade uh, excavating this site. And the convention at the time was the excavators would basically divvy up everything they found and take it home. Okay, that, that's a whole other issue and problem and definitely one we have to deal with. But the result is Yale has thousands and thousands of these artifacts and photographs from Dura Europis now. And a you know, huge number of, of photographs, some of them taken of individual uh, are objects, but a lot of them are field photographs of the site. And that's what's been f fascinating to me is like, how can I understand what it was like to be at and see this whole site? We have these thousands of images of it. How do we put them together? In addition to the field photographs we have uh, from people on the site doing uh, plans of what they understood the buildings to be, uh, simple diagrams of, you know, this, this is a, a diagram of uh, what they believe uh, the Mithraeum looked like at one time. We have um, images of, of the various features. On, on the left here is the Christian baptistry, and on the right is, is the Mithraeum. We have pictures of them at different stages in the excavation. We have uh, various interpretations. This is from the Christian church. The paintings, when the paintings found uh, in, in, in situ, then displayed at one time, no longer in this form at Yale, and then somebody's interpretation of a sketch of what the, the painting looked like. We ha and we have loads of pictures of various physical uh, re reproductions of, of this. So the, the, the making sense of this is trying to put all of these images in a framework to understand what the site looked like during the excavation and what the site looked like when, when, when this was a, a, a busy city, a busy ancient city. And it's not something where there's gonna be one recreation because it's a city that went through many changes over a period of, of 500 years. So what are some ways to help people synthesize all this? One inspiration is some work called Photosynth that, um, that was from uh, Microsoft you know, ages ago. But the idea is instead of trying to recreate 3D, take images and place them according to their viewpoint so that you can walk through and, and, and walk from image to image in, the, an, in a, in a space, spatially meaningful way. So that's um, what this is. This photosynth is, this is a photosynth of multiple photos of this site, but you can sort of tour the site by touring through the uh, uh, images in a spatially meaningful way. It's, it's, uh, it's not perfect because, only, you know, for one thing, I give this, I, I show students these thousands of images from the field photographs and say that I'm interested in, in, in getting a, 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 a mental model of what's going on here. And the first thing everybody thinks of, let's put them in a photogrammetric system, right? Photogrammetry solves everything. We just, we've got lots of images, we'll throw them out, and throw them in, and we'll get a model. No, you won't. These are, these, you know, modern photogrammetry requires um, loads of photographs with lots of overlap. When you think of the um, unknowns you have to solve for as far as camera parameters and point locations, you can't have, you know, five sparsely spaced uh, viewpoints uh, taken over a period of two years and hope to get anything out of it. Not only that, these are historic photographs. There's noisy, there's scratches. There are people in some images, not in some images, different times of day. So short of time travel, photogrammetry is not going to get us anywhere. So, so somehow we have to figure out how to uh, organize the images in their correct viewpoints uh, in another way. And the other thing is we don't like learning the lesson from the objects, we don't want to just look at the images. We want to be able to sketch on and annotate and make notes and you know, uh, make notes of the interpretations we make. So for inspiration for that, um, 
this sort of interpreting uh, a site is similar to architectural design and early architectural design. And this is a, 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 um, a concept that my colleague Julie Dorsey developed some time ago where um, you, you start out with a design with, with sketches of, of, of a scene, but you have individual strokes and you start moving the individual strokes around and eventually evolve to a, a 3D sketch of, of a scene. And she's uh, basically um, uh, developed a product that does this for, for, um, for design called Mental Canvas. This is like a Mental Canvas sketch of Grand Central Station. So I wanna use the idea of the, the photosynth and the sketching together to bring materials together for the site. So this is an example from one, from one feature, the Palmyrene Gate uh, at, at Dura Europis. These are modern photographs because once I get students working on this, they really have a hard time with the grayscale photographs. So generally they start working with these modern photographs. But here's a, an example of, of using a sketch site and placing, and placing uh, the, the photographs in the correct, perspect, uh, per correct viewpoints around a, a sketched view of the object. So this is a way of putting all of these different views of the Palmyrene Gate in a context where you can relate the various photographs to one another instead of just looking at one, looking at another, but starting to get a, a, an idea of how to uh, combine all these images in your mind to uh, an idea of what the overall site looks like. So this is, this is interesting and exciting, but sketching uh, over the images and pushing the strokes is tedious and placing thousands of, of black and white photographs in the correct spot is tedious. And really you have to know the site, you have to be an expert to notice like, oh, that looks like block A, that should go over here. Oh, there's the river, it's over by the citadel. We, what we really need is some context. Fortunately, we're getting it. Separate from uh, what, when we were studying this, um, my colleague, uh, Ann Chen, who is uh, uh, an art historian and archeologist, started this project at Yale to, um, to take all of the information that Yale has about Dura Europis and push Wikidata statements about every artifact, every photograph. And that's giving us context. Basically, um, if, if you, it's, it was called the Yale Digital Dura Europis Archive, now it's the International Archive, now that Ann's moved to Bard, uh, college, but basically for every object, every field photograph, pushing out Wikidata statements of what they are showing, where they're located, when they were taken, basically building a big knowledge graph about all we know about Dura Europis. And in particular, building a gazetteer. So they've gone in and in, in, in immense detail identified each structure in the overall um, site, and then uh, identified both the latitude and longitude to make it an unambiguous location, and then all the names for that structure. For like Palmyrene Gate, it's been called Main Gate. It's got, you know, it's got different names in French, in Arabic. So taking all of the possible names for that structure and associating them with the latitude and longitude. So now, as we do this, we can, we can go into a section and retrieve all the photographs with the various names and associate them with that spot. So right now, this project that, you know, that's mainly Anne's project that I am helping her with, is taking all these field photographs that you can look at individually now at Art Store, but because they're labeled with, you know, what they're of, like here, the main gate or Palmyrene gate, and w what year they were taken, we can locate all these photographs now via the gazetteer in time and space. So that takes care of locating the images. The other place where, um, where uh, machine learning is, is coming in is rather than having people sketch over the key curves to start modeling these sites, 
Um, there was a paper of like how, uh, uh, another paper, it was I think from a group from Facebook, with how do, you, how do you make a sketch from a photograph? And they trained a network to do that. It didn't work great on our photographs, but we just sketched on top of more of our photographs and then extended the training to the, the, uh, the net they already had. And now we have a network that does a pretty good job of extracting strokes from a photograph. You can't just do edge detection. You do you know, canny edge detection on this, and you get a mass of, of all sorts of little things, right? Because you've got all these little rocks, and you know, just, it's just a mess. So training it to extract uh, these stroke features with a machine learning is a great help. So basically, the opportunity now is to uh, process all the images, get the strokes, and then uh, use the uh, geographic locations of the structures to group them in small groups. And we should be able to get a much richer model with more uh, views located in this, in this system to try to comprehend the whole site. So I'm, I think I'm a little over time, so I just want to give credit where credit's due about uh, the research. Uh, the, the materials, a lot of this work was done with, by uh, Yi Wei Hu, who defended his dissertation Monday. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's not quite Dr. Hu, but he'll, he'll be there very soon. He's got to turn in the book. Uh, and another student helping him, Cheng An He, and then uh, a group that they worked with at, at Adobe Research. And uh, obviously our funding was, uh, besides Adobe, uh, we also got money from NSF. And then for the cultural heritage work, involves a lot of people over a lot of time, uh, colleagues, postdocs, students, uh, both uh, in the development of the uh, ideas and the software, and then funding from CVR, NSF, NEH, and uh, the support of, of many uh, collections at Yale. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand. I'll pass the microphone. Um, hello. Um, my question was about the first section of the talk um, where you um, discussed that you were editing the procedures to um, like how that editing was being done, actually. Okay, so in that node graph, uh, and, and I, I skipped over it way too fast, and uh, well, getting back to the slides is, but each, each of these little boxes typically has parameters as input. So basically, it's by changing those parameters, the parameters that we were uh, estimating. Wait, this, uh, so, yeah, here. So in this generic view, See, see the numbers above the filters? So, so every one of the boxes has some parameters that control what they do. And so it's basically by adjusting those parameters that you can do these edits. Now it is, and typically when uh, uh, an artist develops one of these huge points, they expose a small number of these parameters mm -hmm. so that it's, you're not faced with 100 options of maybe this number will make a difference. But it is a really interesting problem that we need to pursue is how do they make that selection of which parameters to expose and associating some semantics with those parameters so that you know this is going to make the, the bricks wider, this is going to make... So it's a, it, th there's a mechanism for it and that's how you can do it, but it's still a trickier process to, to do the edits in a meaningful way than it ought to be. And that, that's still an area where we could do some work and learn how to better expose the most important parameters and give the user some meaning for them and guidance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so if we are able to automatically generate the graph, uh, did this uh, generate any interest in the uh, gaming industries or VFX industries? Because if, if you know what your output can look like and it will be easier for artists to give a graph like this, right? So did it generate any interest in the gaming industries or like 
well, uh, is integrated into any software. I mean, the, the motivation, well, for one thing, Adobe has a lot of resources, so there's a motivation for working with them, but Adobe products, you know, Substance Designer is what a lot of artists in those industries use. So basically, our, our, our short shortcut to reaching those people is through Adobe uh, adopting the technology and making it available through their products because Substance Designer is used by a lot of you know, uh, people who design games and design videos and so forth. So that, that's our, our, our pathway. So yeah, it's, it's one of these things, the tech transfer is not hard because we're working with a company. <laughs> they, they, they just use it. <laughs> Got it, thanks, yeah. thanks. Thank you for your lecture, it was amazing. Um, my question is around uh, augmented reality and holograms, and uh, if you see um, intersections with your work and applied. So for example, um, your heritage site, um, do you have sort of plans or there's investigation around creating you know, experiences either in augmented reality, virtual reality, or in using holograms at the site itself? Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, well, in, in both sides, ARs, I mean, other work that I didn't talk about in material design, we've looked at is, is it more effective to do material design in an AR environment than purely on the screen? And surprise, surprise, the answer is yes. But <laughs> so, because you're working in a known lighting, particularly augmented, because you're working in a situated environment where you understand the lighting and so forth. I haven't pursued it so much in the, um, and, you know, you know we, we did like the, the model of Tutankhamen and throne and so forth. I haven't pursued it as much because it's only really recently that, you know, with, you know, basically the phones have, with, with the investment in phones, having high resolution quality displays is finally there. So that, that, that VR is, is, is an option. So I, I really haven't explored since that happened. I mean, because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you were still looking at cartoons. So a 3D cartoon of the past is really not. And I have seen, you know, I go to cultural heritage meetings and stuff, and occasionally you run into a really compelling experience where, like, I really, but it, it's, real, it's still really hard to create things that are that, you know, real enough that you really feel taken away that you're in another setting. And all you need is, like, one triangle to pop out at you, and the whole thing falls apart, right? You know, suddenly, okay, this, I'm not there. This is just a bunch of triangles. So I, I really haven't pursued it, but I do think for, for, for getting a, a better sense of you know, what, what a space was, uh, what it was like to be in it. I, I used to be very skeptical, but I think we are getting to the point. And certainly, like, you know, I talk to like, people at Yale Divinity School who, you know, like the Institute of Sacred Music, they study um, sacred spaces. And maybe getting to the point where to, you know, what was it like to go into Hagia Sophia when it was a church? You know, what was it like? What, what did you hear and so forth? I think we're getting close to the point where maybe those things can be reproduced in a compelling way. But I really, I really haven't, haven't gone there yet. I think, you know, also the idea of like, you know, a shared space, even in this, in this sketchy space to share annotations and point at things and so forth. But then that's just, you know, the, the equipment investment I haven't sort of <laughs> been able to afford yet to, to work on that. But I, but I think I think it's coming. Yeah. Uh, hi, you mentioned how uh, we can identify using machine learning where the image was captured uh, for the uh, cultural heritage project. So uh, with time, aren't the structures like decaying? So how would you actually place the image when the image was captured when the structures was? I mean the the thing was very different, but now like the image, the current structure is very different. So how do you actually place where this image was captured? Yeah, I mean the the um, so, so so basically at least clustering them around the lat longitude will get a smaller set of 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 of, of uh, photos that we have to work with, and then the idea of sketch, you know, so, so Paul Myring Gate, we can at least say this is the a big cube where we think that structure was inside. So now we have a smaller number of, of, of photos that we can, you know, that we can take on there and 
and basically li like standing like we have a camera itself and line up the view of that box from, from the view of, uh, in that photo and approximate what, what the uh, camera location would have been. That's still a kind of very uh, tedious process, but it's a lot better than choosing one of a thousand images and see if it's there. And I think this idea of <coughs> extracting the contours and then perhaps using those to help line things up also will, you know, we can't get like corner features and stuff or the sort of sift kind of features to line things up. But I, my hope is we can, we can make use of those features to get some perhaps preliminary guesses at, at, at the viewpoints and then just refine those. Or maybe those will be good enough for doing the tour. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. I was uh, kind of curious, especially for some of these cases where you have uh, limited uh, data available, you know, and like kind of sparse yeah. uh, 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 images. Have you, I guess, especially as you, you let's say you want to make the uh, experience more immersive, I, I guess there's at least been a lot of interest, especially lately, about uh, using like NERC based methods to try to not get into uh, new views of the, the space? Have you, I guess, considered Yeah, I mean, well, of course, nerves, I mean, you're, you're, you really need, like, video, right? You, you need lots and lots and lots of images. Uh, so, and, uh, and, and that's an, an area that's, like, moving really fast. Because, you know, some people are still like, well, you get different views, like, oh, my gosh, you can get geometry from them. And that's actually something, replacing sort of the photogrammetry with getting nerf models. That's one thing we're looking at. But, the, but, 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 but NERF, really, um, to, to estimate what's in that volume, you need even more uh, images. You know, it's, 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 in some ways, it's, it's, it's another step in photogrammetry, but making use of lots of data and, real, and populating a, a volume with it. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe s building some sort of... Um, proxy objects and then trying to position them relative to that, maybe we could start sort of squeezing out some depth images that would allow us to do a little bit of getting some parallax or feeling like there's a real 3D thing there. I, I, it's a possibility. It's, it's a possibility. Certainly the whole Nerf thing has set off a whole new, I mean, you know, mad rush. I mean, just the, the papers coming out of that are like, <laughs> it's hard to keep up with. Hi. Um, I just have a uh, question about the, uh, I'm a little bit curious about the software for reconstructing the, uh, uh, the, p the heritage sites. And then, um, so it seems to me that currently we only have graphics that's incorporated into this uh, spatial, um, kind of spatial reconstruction uh, thing. And then is, uh, I'm just curious, is uh, our sound also, um, maybe even smell also incorporating in, in all this um, software to just create a more authentic experience? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't worked on that, but certainly sounds, uh, there, there have been people who've been doing uh, experiments with sound, either taking samples in a space and putting them in a virtual space. Like I was saying, for like sacred spaces and understanding the experience in the church or so forth, it's really important. Um, there has been some work also um, in, in trying to reproduce uh, the, the smells of the past. You know, I, I think you know, um, some uh, people at Warwick in, 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 in the UK, um, you know, like you know, the, the smells of a tannery or something. Actually, you know, like things I don't need to smell, thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, the, there, there, there is a, some attempt to, to work on that because it does... It, but there is also the sort of cultural translation problem uh, that people who lived in that time were used to those smells, we're not. And so if we go into that, it, the impact it has on us is going to be a lot different than the impact that it had on uh, people at the time. So there's yet another issue to deal with is translating impact <laughs> uh, that, that, that you would have had. Um, 
you know, it's like, you know, if I, you know, you, I don't know if you've ever been to Colonial Williamsburg, but the idea that you can, you know, they've rebuilt all the buildings and they've got people in costume. Yeah, but they don't have all the smelly stuff and the horses and th things. But on the other hand, if they did, we still wouldn't be experiencing it the way the colonial population would have experienced it. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough trade-off. But yeah, Thank people, you. yeah, but I think particularly the sound is, is, is important. But I've been struggling so much with the visuals, I haven't, haven't gotten there. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Holly.